from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station, the show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we've got three exciting lessons about Spanish, personal hygiene, and cooking. Well, hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Alex Milanes, and we're kicking things off today with an exciting Spanish lesson. Miss Smith is going to compare and contrast Spanish with English to find out what's the same and what's different. Let's check it out. Hello, thank you for joining us. The video this time is on comparisons and contrasts between English and Spanish as far as punctuation and capitalization. There are a good many differences in Spanish and English when it comes to the, the differences in markings. For example, in, when we're talking about languages, in English, we have English with a capital E. If the Spa Spanish people are saying English or Ingles, it's with a small i. Okay. The same thing is true of months. We capitalize all of our months. In Spanish, you do not. The days of the week also are capitalized in English, but not in Spanish. Nationalities, Canadian or Canadiense, again, not capitalized in Spanish. The pronoun I in English is, I believe, the only one that we have to capitalize even in the middle of a sentence. In Spanish, the, the word yo, which means I, is not capitalized. Now, what I did not include here, but I think we would all know anyway, the beginning word in a sentence is always capitalized in Spanish and English. Now, that's pretty much with capitalization, except for the, the times when it's the same. Con esas cosas es igual, na proper names, nombres propios, like John or Anne, Juan, Ana, England, Inglaterra, Miami, Miami, and so forth. So proper nouns of people, of places are always capitalized in English and in Spanish. With numbers, we have some unusual markings in unusual to us in, in English and, and in Spanish, I guess. Um, when we say 1,000, we put a comma here. When the Spanish say 1,000 or mil, it's, it's a decimal point. And that only works with numbers. When you're talking about the written word or sentences, then, excuse me, um, commas and, and, decimal, and periods are the same in both languages. This would be 1,000 for the English speakers. This is 1,000 for those Hispanic people. A percentage, like we say 3.4, and we use a point. They use the comma. With dollar sign, and I, I made a boo-boo here, this is supposed to be the, um, like the S with two vertical lines, okay? That's the dollar sign. For pesos, it's just one vertical line. The numbers one and seven in the United States anyway, are written usually in this way. For Spanish speaking people, and really in a lot of the world, the one and the seven are different. The seven has a line through it. Okay. 
with words. We use these as quotation marks. In Spanish, they use these markings. Hello! Exclamation point at the end. In Spanish, you have the one inverted here and the one at the end. Okay. How are you? Question mark. Como estas? Same as here. You have an inverted question mark and then a regular question mark. I did not mention accent marks, and maybe I should do that here. Spanish has an accent mark like this over vowels, here over the O, here over the A, and it changes the meaning of the word slightly. They also have this mark, which is called a tilde. And that's what makes the sound espanol, espanol. It's a ny sound. We don't have that mark. We don't really have accent marks in English. So it takes a little bit of getting used to when to use as those accent marks. And sometimes you can leave them off and it's not a big deal. Other times it makes a difference in the meaning. So here's a little... <clears throat> paragraph that I wrote, um, it's, it's wrong for uh, English, I think it's wrong for English, but we're going to look and see what changes would be made if you were writing this in English. For example, this February, my family and I were not able to go to Mexico. Okay, there are a few mistakes there. Los hispanohablantes pueden ver los, los uh, problemas. Spanish or English speakers, I'm sure you've picked them out right away. Okay, this one should be capital. This should be capital. capital, okay? In May, we will rent a house in the mountains of West Virginia, okay? May, West Virginia. This would be true, eso sería verdad para los dos lenguas, los dos idiomas, okay? for English and for Spanish, because it is a proper name, nombre propio. It costs $1,000 a week. Okay, what is wrong here? Hmm, well, is this dollars or pesos? That's pesos, so we have to change it to dollars. We also have to change that. It has a hot tub and three and a half bathrooms. Three and a half. That doesn't look right for us, for English. So we would say 3.5. You want to come along? This one's okay, but we don't need that one. Now in Spanish, of course, the small f would be good. In febrero, my family, y yo, small y, we're not able to go to Mexico. It would still be a capital M because Mexico is a proper name. <clears throat> In May, little m, Mayo, okay. We will rent a house in the mountains of West Virginia 
that is the rest of that is correct. Thanks, Ms. Smith. All right, now in our next segment, we're going to take a look at personal hygiene. Miss Alexis has a great lesson about the importance of proper hand washing. Let's check it out. Hi everyone, my name is Alexis. I am a junior at Riverside High School and I attend the Diagnostic Service Program at Carver Career Center. I am here today to teach young aspiring minds how we can all help during this COVID-19 pandemic. I hope you guys enjoy this video as much as I did, and always remember to have fun while Before you we get started with our activity, I would like to tell you about how we can all do a part and help decrease the spread of the coronavirus. You guys will learn your part and how you can help today. Germs are these teeny tiny living organisms. They can get into our bodies and make us really sick. They make us sick with all different kinds of illnesses. We can't see them with our eyes, which makes it tricky, but they're spread through saliva, or when you sneeze and cough and don't cover, or when you sneeze and cough into your hands and you don't wash them properly afterwards. We're gonna do a fun activity to where you guys can really visualize how these germs are spread when you don't use proper hygiene after. In this video, the pepper is going to represent germs. As you can see, they're on my hands. But whenever I put soap on my finger, the germs suddenly spread away. That is how important it is to wash your hands after you touch something. This is a proper way to wash your hands. You need to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. The best way to ensure that is to sing your ABCs. First, you're gonna wet your hands, and then you're gonna lather them in soap. And then you're gonna take this soap and scrub it everywhere you can think of, under your fingernails, in between your fingers. Scrub your hands, scrub your palms, scrub everywhere multiple times, the best you can. Whenever you feel your hands are clean, you can rinse them under the water, but do not turn the faucet off with your clean hands. Use your arm to turn it off, or you get a paper towel and use that, because if you touch it, then you're just going to reapply the germs that you originally washed off. One of the things we learn at Carver is how to properly take somebody's vital signs. Vital signs are very important for the healthcare workers. It can help us detect if something is wrong with the patient, whether it be infection, disease, any type of illness. You guys can practice these on your parents, your pets, your siblings, whatever you would like. You may not have the equipment for all of them and that is okay. Just watch here so you can learn how to properly take some That is vitals. going to be my patient for doing our vital signs today. He is an employee at CAMC Memorial Hospital and is on the front line of this virus. The first vital sign that we will be doing today is blood pressure. Blood pressure is simply just how hard your heart is working to get blood throughout your body. Now you may not know what the word means or what it is, but I'm 100% sure that you've had yours taken at the doctor's office. Whenever you go to the doctor and this nurse puts a band around your arm and she squeezes a knob and it gets really, really tight, and then you begin to feel a thump in your arm, that's getting your blood pressure taken. A normal reading is 120 over 80. To take a blood pressure, you want to make sure the patient is in a relaxed position. The legs cannot be crossed, otherwise it will mess with the reading. Let the arm rest and make sure the patient is not holding a fist shape. You want to make sure that you have the right size cuff. You don't want to use an adult cuff on the child. Locate the pulse in the brachial artery on the bend of the arm. I used a stethoscope. Hold your stethoscope over the pulse and inflate the cuff and then deflate it once you think that you are high enough. Record the reading. The next vital sign that we will be talking about is temperature. I'm almost for certain that you guys have had your temperature taken. Whether it be for a get well child, yearly checkup at your pediatrician's office, or just because you're feeling sick, you may be running a fever. Now your mom has probably taken it, or somebody at the doctor's office, and they put it under your tongue or in your ear. A normal reading temperature is 98.6. This is how you take a temperature. You just place it in the ear, hold the button down, and wait for it to beep.
The last set of vital signs that we will be learning is pulse and oxygen saturation. Now I know those are extremely big words and you probably have no clue what they are, but don't worry, I will tell you. Your pulse is just how many times your heart beats a minute. It is very important that those times are anywhere from 60 to 100 beats per minute. That is your normal reading. Now your oxygen saturation is just how much oxygen you have in your blood. It's very important that your oxygen set is anywhere between 95 to 100. You don't want to go under 95. It is very crucial for your body parts to make sure it has enough oxygen to keep doing what it's doing. It is actually very simple to take an oxygen saturation. You just use this little monitor and place it on the pointer finger. It gives you the patient's pulse and their oxat. To check your pulse at your wrist, place two fingers over the radial artery, which is on the thumb side of the wrist. When you feel the beats, count them for 15 seconds. Multiply by four and get your number of beats per minute. As you will see in the next video, I am taking my dog Blackie's pulse. Their heartbeat is a little bit different than ours. It's a lot faster, up to 180 beats per minute. Their heartbeat sounds like this. Heartbeat sounds like this. Thanks, Miss Alexis. You know, washing our hands is always important, but it's especially important to do right before cooking. So for our final segment, let's wash our hands and meet Mr. Koble in the kitchen for an awesome culinary lesson. So we started to caramelize our mirepoix, and we're gonna add our tomato product, and again, that's called a pinsage. After doing that, and we cook it and caramelize everything, we're gonna add flour. When you make a roux, in the ingredients such as mirepoix with the fat and the ingredients, uh, aromatics. Um, when you make that, that process is called sanger. And that is actually typically done for braised dishes or espagnole or anything like that. Uh, we basically are caramelizing these. Our, our carrots have gotten a little caramelized. We added our celery. They're caramelizing and now we're adding our onions. And you can see there's quite a bit of fat in there, but that's gonna be the basis for a roux. Now, when we use roux, uh, which is traditionally fat, traditionally clarified butter, uh, but you can use other fats as well, it's, the process is called gelatinization. And gelatinization uh, is what you see in pastas. It's basically where the flour absorbs water. Uh, um, and so pastas absorb water, rices absorb water. Uh, and that's what gelatinization is. So what happens is as you cook it, uh, you're going to notice that the sauce is thickening. That's just from the flour absorbing some of the moisture. And the more flour you use, the thicker it's going to be. The less flour you use, the thinner it's going to be. Uh, so that's the process that we use when using a roux. Uh, and these, all these sauces, except for hollandaise, actually use the process of using a roux. Uh, and that process of picking it up called gelatinization. So we're going to caramelize this. This is actually getting there pretty close. I think maybe another two or three minutes and then we should be able to add our tomato product in it. I'm gonna to try to heat up just a little bit. Um, and then we're going to add in some, after we make our roux, our sanger, we're gonna actually add some brown veal stock and a sachet. And then we're gonna let it simmer. The, the key that you need to recognize is when you cook with roux, that they need to simmer after becoming, uh, getting to a boil because uh, gelatinization happens between 150 and 212, which is boiling temperature. Uh, you need to let them simmer for at least 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes to cook out any of that raw, starchy, floury flavor. So you always wanna make sure that you let you, your sauce simmer for the appropriate time. You also wanna make sure that you're using more liquid than you need uh, because you're, it's in that process of simmering, you're gonna lose some evaporation. Um, 
and also that stock, that additional stock will fortify or strengthen the sauce. So we've caramelized our mirepoix, we've added tomato, um, and we have basically um, caramelized that as well. We've cooked it down, and now we're gonna add the flour. And this again, this whole process is considered songe. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna mix that flour right in with the fat. Should kinda look almost like a reddish sand, or a brown sand, hopefully more of a brown than a red. And you can see, where that actually worked out pretty well. Now we have to cook roux. Uh, the more you cook a roux, the more or the less it will thicken. So you wanna make sure that you cook it appropriately for what you're using. Um, this one's actually gonna become, we wanna cook it a little bit, it's gonna be a brown roux. Um, so we're just going to let this go. It's not gonna take long. Uh, the reason why I use this pan, this rondo, is so that it would cook fairly quickly. Uh, then we're going to add in our beef stock, our brown veal stock, actually. It's not beef stock, it's brown veal stock. Uh, and then we're going to add our sachet. And then we're going to let it set for about 30 to 40 minutes in that process. And you can see here that we're starting to brown. And some of that flour is starting to stick to the pan. You want to make sure that when you do this process that you're scraping your pan of any flour that is starting to stick because if it burns, then you're gonna to have to start all over, okay? And again, this shouldn't take too long. It's starting to get some color on it already. Now, when incorporating a roux into a liquid, there's, there's a couple of um, rules of thumb. One rule of thumb is you either take room temperature roux and incorporate it into a hot liquid, or you take room temperature liquid and incorporate it into a hot roux. Um, and we're gonna actually, on this one, you're gonna see where we actually incorporate the liquid into the warm roux. I will actually take the pan off when I'm incorporating it so that it doesn't splatter because once stuff starts to thicken and it gets that viscosity, if it splashes up on you, it can really hurt when you get, if it gets up on your skin. Okay, and right now I'm going more by smell. It's kind of tough to, to see a brown, um, but when you start to toast or cook wheat or nuts, you get that kind of nutty smell. And that's why I'm going by. Because it, because of the tomato, it's kind of hard to tell if it's brown or not. So I'm going kind of by smell, Anton. And you can see I'm scraping down, making sure, yeah. All right, so now at this point, got some nice color to it. I'm gonna go ahead and add our brown stock. And I'm gonna pull it off. And I'm going to let it kind of cool down a little bit. I'm gonna add a little bit. And I like to add it slowly in batches. Uh, and what this does is allows me time enough to incorporate the key that we wanna do here is you don't want lumps because once you get lumps in it, you're not gonna get them out unless you strain them out. And that also will impact the thickness of your final product. You can see I incorporated enough to make it almost like a paste, okay? Getting all that liquid in there. You can see how it's becoming a paste. Now I'm gonna add some more and I'm gonna incorporate that. Again, just stirring it in. At this point, we really shouldn't have any concerns about it becoming lumpy on us because we have, we've already done that initial incorporation and we've already diluted our roux with enough stock. Now you can do this with a whisk. Um, some chefs will want you to do it with a whisk. You just do what your chef or your chef instructor tells you to do. But you can see, uh, because I, 
followed the process, you can see that it actually diluted the roux uh, enough so that when we add this last, last batch, or this last, yeah, the last batch of stock to it, um, it's gonna be ready to go. So you can see now we have a very nice, uh, again, Espanol. It's, guys, it's just a term for, that we use for brown sauce. And I'm gonna go ahead and just add all of this to it. Stir it around. Remembering that the roux have to come up to at least 150 and they gradually thicken as it goes to boiling. Okay, but you gotta bring it to a boil to get all of that complete uh, gelatinization happening. I'm scraping off any, oops, scraping off any of the sides. That was an accident. All right, now we're gonna go in, set this to the side. We're gonna go ahead and drop in a sachet, which we normally, we've talked about. Okay, just a little bit. Uh, you wanna get in the habit of always tying your sachet to the handle, uh, just so that you can get it, remove it easily. And then we're gonna put this back on heat, moderate heat. Okay, so mid to high heat to have it a boil. Thanks, Mr. Kobel. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We wanna thank everyone who shared their awesome lessons, and we wanna thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station.